uh, welcoming all of you um, to the IEC. My name is Susan Irwin. I'm the director of the IEC, and um, I have to tell you that if you are interested uh, in following or participating in other events like this, of which there are many, uh, you can always visit our website and follow us on social media. And we, you can find us at IHCUCSB. Adam, that, that good? That's good? That's good. Yes, this is the, our media guru says, I've got to say this all the time. <laughs> so follow us. We tweet, we Facebook, we Instagram. Instagram. It's, we're there. So be there with us. Um, and in this moment, I cannot tell you how happy I am to that Victoria Law is with us today to speak in our annual public event series, Social Securities. Um, Victoria Law is the author of Resistance Behind Bars, The Struggles of Incarcerated Women. The first edition of the book, published in 2009, won the 2009 PASS Award. PASS is the acronym for Prevention for a Safer Society. In 2012, Law co-edited the collection Don't Leave Your Friends Behind, supporting parents and children in social justice movements. This is an anthology with 52 contributors from across the globe, and it focuses on issues affecting children and caregivers within the framework of social justice, mutual aid, and collective liberation. Law's more recent writings include Against Carceral Feminism, which appeared in the collection The Long Term, Resisting Life Sentences, Working Toward Freedom, and also recently Your Pregnancy May Subject You to Even More Law Enforcement Violence, published in the volume Who Do You Serve? Who Do You Protect? <coughs> Just 10 days ago, she published a piece in Bloomberg Business Week called Paper Mail Still Matters to People Behind Bars about the elimination of personal mail in the Pennsylvania prison system. The state is now digitizing all letters and sending that are sent to prisoners. And you may also know that the ACLU is preparing, of course, to sue Pennsylvania prisons over this new mail policy. In the introduction to Resistance Behind Bars, Law relates that when she was 15, she started visiting friends of hers who were being recruited by gangs and were ending up in jail. When she was 16, she herself was arrested for armed robbery and held briefly in the Manhattan Detention Complex, where those awaiting arraignment are placed. She was released with, pro uh, with probation, probably, as she writes, quote, because 16-year-old Chinese, Chinese girls who get straight A's in school did not seem particularly menacing. These experiences were part of the reason Law became involved in prisoner support. In 1996, she started Books Through Bars New York City, a group that sends free books to prisoners nationwide. In 2000, she began speaking and writing about the needs and actions of women in prison. Since 2002, she has worked with incarcerated women nationwide to publish the zine Tenacious, Art and Writings by Women in Prison, which is filled with articles, essays, poetry, and art by formerly and currently incarcerated women across the US. Law created this scene because people inside prisons do not have access to printers, copy machines, postage, and other resources necessary to support the production um, of publications. Law notes that in her book, Resistance Behind Bars, um, quote, no, she notes that her book, Resistance Behind Bars, quote, should not be mistaken for a call for more humane or gender responsive prisons. But she also observes that, quote, while we strive for a better world, one in which prisons are obsolete, we must not forget about the more than two million people who are currently locked away. We need to acknowledge and address their daily realities as well as recognize the dangers they face when they speak out about these realities while also questioning why it is necessary to have the system. And I want to say that Victoria Law's work has been a real inspiration for the IHC's prison education program, Foundations of the Humanities, which is a correspondence, correspondence course for incarcerated individuals staffed by UCSB humanities and social science graduate students. 
To date, we have worked with approximately 200 prisoners, and this month we anticipate registering 100 more people for the course. So what is very inspiring, I just want to conclude by noting, about Law's work is that it reflects her belief in the necessity of fundamental social transformation, prison abolition, along with clear-eyed and empathic practical engagement with incarcerated women. It is a deep pleasure to have Victoria Law in my seat to speak to her about her fantastic work. Please welcome her. So if I, don't, if I don't deafen you, I'm going to start by giving you a few statistics and figures, even though that they're very exciting, to give you a sense of the breadth and the depth of this issue. So today, there are 219,000 women behind bars. So 219,000, that's 96,000 in local. So in comparison, before I go into like who goes where, in 1980, there were 26,378 women in jails and prisons. So those of you who might be able to do math better than me can figure out what percentage, you know, how much we've jumped from 26,378 to 219,000. Today, of those 219,000, we have 96,000 in local jails. Keep in mind that jails are typically places where people are sent to pre-trial. So you get arrested and you are either, a judge either sets bail and you cannot afford this amount of money to guarantee that you will come back to court and get sent to jail. Or the judge will say, no, we think that your crime is too horrendous or you're a flight risk. You do not get bail you sit in jail. And across the nation, approximately 70 to 75 percent of people in jails are sitting there pre-trial. So they are technically innocent until proven guilty, but yet they're still sitting behind bars. There are 99,000 people, women in state prisons, and 14,000 in federal prisons. 4,600 in youth prisons, so that means there are 4,600 young girls, um, ranging anywhere from like 10 to 16 years of age, depending on what state. Um, some states might even hold young girls up to ages 17 or 18. Um, 3,700 in immigrant detention, a sharp rise in women in immigrant detention since 2016. And then the rest are in some sort of either civil commitment, um, Indian country jails, or military prisons. Again, we have that sharp jump from 26,378 women in jails and prisons. Keep in mind that this number does not include the number of trans women who are being held in men's facilities. So all of those places that I talked about, imagine the unknown number of trans women who are being held in men's jails, prisons, youth prisons, immigrant detention, et cetera, who are just not being counted. So since this series is called Social Securities, and we're talking about structural inequities and injustices, Let's talk about who's in prison and what these structural inequities and injustices have to do with incarceration. So first of all, we can't talk about prisons without talking about race. So think of this, of every 100,000 black women, there are 103 who are incarcerated. For white women, that number is 52. So we can see that there already is a sharp divide in who gets targeted by police, who gets prosecuted, whose charges get dropped, um, who gets perhaps a diversion or an alternative to incarceration program, and who does not. For Latino women, 64 of every 100,000 end up incarcerated. And perhaps very tellingly, we don't have nationwide data available for people of other ethnicities. So we might know that Native women in Oklahoma are disproportionately incarcerated, but we maybe don't know anything about Native women in Montana, you know, and their incarceration rates. We may not know anything about Asian people in Idaho, 
and their incarceration rates. We just don't have that kind of data. Um, and this data is important because we can then use that to see how our laws and how our policing practices and our prosecutorial practices end up impacting communities and women of different ethnicities. Of these women um, that I talked about, we have to keep in mind that contrary to what political pundits and political hopefuls will um, are saying, this is not because women of color are committing more crimes, but because we can see the ways in which policing profiles different communities and different races. So for instance, a study by the Department of Justice, which is something that we in this room probably already know, found that African Americans and Latinos are three times more likely than white people to be searched, arrested, threatened, or subdued with force when stopped by the police. So we've seen this again and again and again and again and again. And again. Um, in New York City, the New York Police Department released its stop and frisk statistics showing that of the 686,000 people who have been stopped on the street in 2011, nearly 90% were black or Latino. In New York City, we have a good number of people of color, but blacks and Latinos make up less than 53% of the city's population. Um, conversely, of the people that the NYPD stopped, 9% were white and 4% were Asian. As Susan mentioned earlier, I did not have a stellar, upstanding teenage, you know, 16th year. You know, I did some things, you know, but I would have been not stopped if the NYPD had a stop and frisk policy, even though I was probably more likely than half of the black and Latino population to be carrying something illegal on me that year. But hooray for, you know, discretionary policing. Um, then, when you get past the policing stage to the court stage, we can see how prosecutorial discretion, that is when the district attorney or the prosecutor has the discretion to say, I want to press charges, I want to press the highest charges, or I might be willing to offer a bargain and let you go to a drug treatment program or some sort of alternative to incarceration program. And a study done here in California found that two-thirds of drug treatment slots went to white people, and that 70% of people with drug sentences were African American. So we can see how even in the, you know, when you get to the court side, what, uh, race and racism play a huge role in who goes to prison and who does not. How many of you have heard the name Susan Burton? Okay. So Susan Burton is a formerly incarcerated black woman who now runs um, a series of reentry programs in Los Angeles. She was in and out of jail and prison for over 20 years. She's an African-American woman from Los Angeles, a part of Los Angeles that's heavily policed. I'm not from California. I do not know your geography. It is from one of those parts of uh, Los Angeles. I will not pretend to know which part it is. Um, but she was constantly arrested, called before a judge, given a jail sentence or a prison sentence for drugs. Not once did her lawyer, or the prosecutor, or the judge ever say, you are always in here. You have a rap sheet a mile long for drugs. Why don't we try sending you to drug treatment? So then, at some point, she gets arrested, she goes to jail, and she's in a cell with a white cellmate. And the white cellmate says, I'm going to ask my lawyer if I can go to this treatment program, which people jokingly called Addicts University. That. She said, it's the drug treatment program you can go to instead of going to prison. You know, I've gone to it twice already. You know, I'm going to go to it a third time. I'm going to see my lawyer. We'll just ask for it. I usually get it. And Susan says, you know, nobody ever told me about this program. So she asked her attorney to ask for it. Her attorney knew nothing about this. They go before the judge. The judge says, okay. And she gets to this drug treatment program and finds out that it is almost all white, because the only people who somehow seem to know about this and have been offered this program were the white women and the white men who ended up in the criminal justice system. The black women, like Susan, and so many other people were just sent to jail or to prison. So again, see how recent racism play out in the court system. Um, the San Jose Mercury News conducted a study that reviewed 700,000 cases that actually matched people by their crime and their past arrest.
arrest and conviction history. And they found that even if you account for people in similar situations, whites were far more successful than blacks or Latinos at every stage of these pretrial negotiations. Um, we also can't talk about prisons and incarceration and jails without talking about class. And when we're talking about incarceration and gender and women in incarceration, we also have to remember that the inequalities, the economic inequalities that affect us on the outside, like the fact that, you know, I'm able to, you know, like if Adam and I are in the same job market, you know, employers are more likely to pay him more than they are me, you know, I'm more likely to make more than you are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when we're talking about incarceration, only 40% of all incarcerated women have been employed full time before. And this was several years ago before the economy fell into the toilet. And of these 40% of all incarcerated women, most have held low paying jobs before the incarceration. These were jobs that were not necessarily going to pay all their bills, put a roof over their head, and to make sure that their children had food, shoes, etc. The median annual income of an incarcerated person before arrest was $19,185. Think about trying to live on $19,185. Now, let us throw in the gender pay gap. And the median pre-prison income for a woman in prison was $13,890. And imagine trying to live off of that, even as a single but most likely as somebody who has somebody else dependent upon them, children, um, you know, uh, um, other dependents. And then when we throw race into it, it kind of becomes a big, you know, a big jumble of inequalities. So incarcerated white women earned about $15,000 before their incarceration. And for women of color, it was even less. Incarcerated black women reported earning about $12,700 before their arrest. Black men, in contrast, earned about $17,600. So imagine living off of either of those. Incarcerated Latinas earned nearly, 12, nearly but not quite $12,000. So we have those structural inequalities that face people even before they go to prison and are pathways for things that push people into prison. We also, you combine that with the slashing of the economic and societal safety. So let's jump back to 1996, when Congress and the President passed welfare reform, which put a five-year lifetime limit on welfare, excluded support for children from mothers who are already on welfare. So if you're on welfare and you have another child, uh, you are unable to apply for welfare for that other, you know, for your next child. It required people to work after two years. So too bad, so sad if you don't have child care. I'm told these days child care costs about $2,000 a month. Welfare does not cover $2,000 a month child care. And there was a lifetime ban on welfare benefits for people who had committed felonies or who had violated probation or parole. And that stipulation alone, that lifetime ban, excluded over 100,000 women from welfare programs. And by the end of the 1990s, so four years later, the number of people receiving welfare had fallen more than 50% or 6.5 million people. And about 40% of those who left remained unemployed years later. That same year that welfare got slashed, the number of women in prison rose by 9.1%, doubling the number of men who had been sent to prison that year. So, and the numbers keep rising. So at the end of 1996, there were about 75,000 women in state or federal prison. At the end of 2000, that number was 91,612. And today, there are 103,000 women in prison. And then again, there's 219,000, you know, in all these other places overall. So these are some of the things to think about when you think about who is in prison. It is not just somebody did something bad, somebody broke the law. You know, they should be punished and we care what happens to them, but we need to look at all of these multiple forces that are in place that leads to these actions. Now that I have depressed you with this, I'm going to depress you a little bit more before we talk about the things that are happening inside jails and prisons and what people inside and outside are doing about this. But first, I will talk about what happens to people once they are in prison. 
be a lot of people in women's prisons. So, contrary to what you might think, when you see things like orange is the new black, prisons are not nice places. You don't get to roam around and do whatever you want. You don't get to like, you know, walk around, talk to your friends, go to the yard, not go to the yard, go to the lunch hall. Every movement is strictly controlled. You need a pass and permission to go from your housing unit or your dormitory or your cell to someplace else. You don't get to just be able to walk out. Um, if you are found in a place where you are not supposed to be, you can be given what's called a disciplinary ticket, which could mean things like you lose your right to make phone calls. You lose your right to shop at the commissary or the prison store for that little bit of nothing that you might need. Like maybe you might be able to buy you know, some you know, dry food at the store. Maybe you might be able to buy some tampons, you know, because the sanitary napkins that they give you are about as thin as toilet paper, and you really don't want to use those. Maybe you are not able to go on a special program or a special visit with your children for Mother's Day because you've got this ticket. Um, and the tickets can also add up so that you might end up going to solitary confinement, which I'll think of that next part. But imagine being stuck in like a tiny little closet, you know, or something maybe the size of like two closets put together, you know, like a eight by ten room with nothing in it except for a toilet and a sink and a slab that is your that you might or might not have a mattress on it. And imagine being locked in that room for 23 to 24 hours a day. And that is solitary. So all of these things add up to that. So other conditions. So in addition to this extreme, extreme loss of liberty, um, there are conditions facing women in prison, such as health care. And this is not to say that people in men's prisons or jails have extremely good health care. I'm not saying that at all. So to kind of give you an idea of this, think about having inadequate, substandard, often life-threatening now imagine having even worse health care than that because nobody actually acknowledges your conditions, and that would be women's prison health care. Now imagine having even worse conditions than that because you are trans or gender non-conforming, and that is for like your like floor, your cellar, and your sub-cellar of health care. So many jails and prisons are not likely to have female-specific health care. That means if you are, say, pregnant when you go into prison or jail, you might not get proper prenatal care. You might not get timely prenatal care. Um, they might not even really know what to do with you, even though it should be standard and routine for places that incarcerate women to have somebody on staff that knows this. Um, women don't get breast and cervical cancer screenings, and gynecological services are either grossly inadequate or Women in prison are also more likely to be HIV positive than either men in prison or women on the outside, yet HIV services, education, and treatment are often non-existent. More than half of all women in prison are mothers to children under the age of 18. So think about that 219,000 number I just said, and divide that into roughly half, and imagine how many children don't have their moms with them. And again, not to say that men in prison are living this wonderful high life, but when a father goes to prison, oftentimes he has a family member, usually a female family member, his wife, his mother, his girlfriend, his ex-girlfriend, his sister, his cousin, somebody will step up and take care of his children. When a mother goes to prison, oftentimes she's already a single head of household, um, her partner is working alongside of her, her partner is not willing or able to take care of the children, Perhaps her partner is not safe, um, a safe co-parent or safe parent for the child, and perhaps her family is unwilling, unable, or not safe to take care of the child. And as a result, children of imprisoned mothers are five times more likely to end up in foster care than children of incarcerated fathers. And this becomes particularly pernicious because, again, going back to the 1990s when all sorts of draconian legislation was passed. Uh, Congress and the President passed the Federal Adoption and Safe Families Act, which states that if a child has been in foster care for 15 of the past 22 months, the state has to start proceedings to terminate parental rights. 
And in some states, the timeline is even shorter. In Oklahoma, which has the highest rate of women's incarceration, for instance, if the child is under the age of four, in other words, if they are kind of cute and cuddly and still adoptable, the timeline is six of the past 12 months. So if a mom is in jail or prison, say, for seven months, and her child has been in foster care as a result, the state begins proceedings to terminate parental rights. Then there's also the issue I talked about earlier of pregnancy and something very specific to jails and prisons called shackling, which happens to pregnant women when they're taking, or anybody when they're taken out of a jail or prison to go to court, to go to a hospital, to go to medical care, to go to you know, somebody's funeral. And less than half of states have legislation that either ban or limit the use of shackles on pregnant people during labor. So for those of you who don't know what shackling looks like, it looks like this. You get handcuffed, and your handcuffs are attached to a chain. And this chain wraps around a belly chain. So for those of you who bike, there seems to be a lot of people who bike in Santa Barbara, and you have your bicycle chain. So imagine having this bicycle chain around your belly. So you have this heavy bicycle chain. And then there's another chain that leads to <coughs> your waist chain to your ankles, which are shackled together. And then in many states, like New York, I don't remember if California has a special chain, there's something called a black box, which is a little box that sits on your belly chain. And the sole purpose is to pull your hands close so that you can't move your hands. Pregnant people, pregnant women are already at increased risk of falling because you are huge and uncomfortable and clumsy. So to have, so to be walking like this and then not to be able to catch yourself is hugely dangerous. And like I said, less than half of states have legislation that ban or limit this, even when it comes to kids in labor and delivery. Um, there is a lack of educational and vocational opportunities in many women's prisons. This is often because women's prisons are further away. They need to be in remote places that are hard to get to. Um, and women in prison, as people in every, people in whatever kinds of prison they're in, men's prisons, men's jails, women's prisons, men's jails, uh, women's jails, um, face pervasive sexual assault and abuse. So this can range from straight up sexual assault, sexual harassment, but also the everyday workings of prison. So when you are in a prison and you go to visit somebody, um, so you go to your visiting room and you see your grandma and you see your mom, you know, like, in, you know, you're looking forward to seeing your family. The first thing that happens before you even get to go to that visiting room is that you are strip searched to make sure you are not bringing anything into the visiting room that you are not supposed to be pregnant other than yourself. So that in itself can be traumatic for many people. Then you have your visit. And then you come out and you are strip searched again to make sure that you are not given, you know, you have not been given anything to bring back to your housing unit or into the prison. So right then and there, there's just this automatic way in which prisons dehumanize and sexually abuse and re-traumatize many people inside. So even if every correctional officer and every guard is the most stellar, wonderful, upstanding, not assaulted person. Part of their job is to do these things that sexually demand people. And finally, um, there is domestic violence and abuse as a pathway to prison, particularly into women's jails and prisons. More than half of women in state prisons and jails have reported experiencing physical and or sexual abuse before their arrest. So keep in mind that this is even before they get arrested. Um, also keep in mind that as we're seeing, as we're being reminded of the Me Too movement, that many people don't report sexual abuse. They don't report physical abuse. And imagine being in a prison where any, you know that anything you say or do can be used against you. And somebody comes up to you with a clipboard and wants to know if you know you want to check off this, you know, I'm a rape victim, I'm a domestic violence victim. And most people probably don't want to report that. So we can imagine that these numbers are much, much higher than just half. Um, so, now that I've thrown all of these horrifying realities at you, I 
let's talk about some of the ways that women inside jails and prisons have resisted and organized against these conditions. Because October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and because I'm in California, the story starts in Ohio, but it will get to California, I promise. Um, let's talk about the ways in which domestic violence survivors have organized around not only the fact that they have ended up in prison because they were abused victims and the system repeatedly failed them, but ways in which they organized for their own freedom. So we go to Ohio, to the one women's prison in Ohio, in Marysville, Ohio, and there was a group of women with long sentences and life sentences that just wanted to form a support. We're all doing lots and lots and lots of time. How are we going to get through this? This is in the late 1980s. Um, for those of you who don't remember the late 1980s, it was a time in which people were not talking about domestic violence. Like, this was something that was really taboo, and you know, nobody talked about it. And you definitely did not really bring it up in court, and the police would probably not respond to your 911 call if you bothered to call the police. Um, if they did come, they would tell your the person that was abusing you to go take a walk, pull off, or calm down, and that was about it. So, in the late 1980s, a bunch of women with long sentences or life sentences decided that they were going to form a support group. And it was called the Life Group, or Looking Inward for Excellence. And they started talking. And originally, it was not meant to be a political group, it was not meant to be a group about abuse. But as they were talking, we realized that many of them had these life sentences because they had killed their abusive partner. And this was not like a boring thing. This was like the result of many, many conversations. And they decided they were going to begin organizing around domestic violence. And they decided that they wanted to see what they could do because they felt that it was really unfair that after suffering years and years and years of abuse at the hands of someone who supposedly loved them and cherished them and blah, 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 you know, they finally fought back and they were the ones doing time. I'm doing a lot of time. So they invited, they wrote a letter to the governor of Ohio, um, and they invited him to come to one of their meetings. And they said, you know, we really want to talk to you about this issue of domestic violence and how it's led so many of us to prison, or pushed so many of us into prison. And he sent one of his aides, and he sent his wife to the prison, and they attended one of these life group meetings and listened to the women. And then they said, you know, you should apply for clemency. Those of you who don't know, clement, um, Trump hasn't made it famous. Clemency is when people apply for either a pardon, which means your record is totally expunged, as if it had not your arrest and conviction had not happened, or a shortening of your sentence, which is called a commutation. So basically, if you say you got a life sentence, it could be shortened, say, to 20 years, and you would then be eligible to get out, as opposed to spending the rest of your life in prison. Or if you've got a 20 year sentence, it could be to something much shorter so you could get out sooner. So the women there decided that they were going to apply for clemency, and they also said, you know, how many other women in this prison actually have the same circumstances or similar circumstances and also should apply? Again, keeping in mind by now, just like 1919, 1991, that we're still really not talking about domestic violence. So they went around to the different housing units and dining rooms and the library in the yard and wherever else. And keep in mind what I said before, prison is not actually orange to black. You get to wander around all over the place. You get to go from point A to point B with a pass and that is it. And somehow, these women still managed to go around the prison and talk to other women. And they started asking, hey, what are you in here for? You know, what happened? And they started conversations and they talked to women about what had led to them in prison. You know, and they helped, in some cases, they helped women overcome denial that they had been abused. Because again, remember, we weren't really, people weren't really talking about abuse um, back then. And to understand what abuse was, that they weren't awful, terrible people that deserved to rot in prison for the rest of their lives because they fought back. Um, help them recall incidents, specific incidents of battering and where they might find witnesses or documentation. Hey, remember that time you had to go to the hospital? Hey, remember that time, you know, like this happened in front of your neighbor or in front of your teacher or something else? And in the end, this led to 18 more women applying for clemency. So this is 18 more women who might have just sat in their cells for who knows how many years. 
thinking that they were awful, terrible, no good people because they had killed them. Instead of understanding that there were these dynamics of abuse, of years and years and years of abuse that finally led to that moment. So all of these women applied for clemency, and in the end, 25 women were granted clemency. So the governor decided to shorten the sentence and um, basically give freedom to 25 of these women. And it was the first mass clemency of domestic And this made headlines of the nomination. Um, some places got it, some places didn't. You know, like there were, there were some, you know, some headlines that were like, you know, be careful, husband, you know, a woman can kill her husband now and go free, you know, husband killer is gone, you know, all sorts of things. But the point is, it made headlines all over, and it made headlines, and it made its way into the California women's prison in Corona. Um, and there, there was a, a support group called Convicted Women Against. Again, it was originally a self-help group, but it was specifically for women to identify as domestic violence victims. And they met weekly, and they talked about their issues, and they supported each other. And one day, somebody comes in with a newspaper clipping, and it's like, hey, did you see what happened in Ohio? You know, they did this mass clemency. A lot of people do this as well. So they decided they were going to organize their own mass clemency club. So they wrote a letter to the governor, who was then Pete Wilson, and they asked him to consider commuting their sentences. And they asked him not only to consider commuting their sentences, the women who had signed this letter, but they said, would you please consider commuting the sentences of every single woman who was incarcerated for killing her abusive partner? They also said, please come to one of our weekly meetings so that you can hear our stories and understand how we ended up in prison and we can have a conversation. Now, California, you know, love to elect these law and order type politicians. So Wilson declined. He said that he would not come to any of their meetings. He would not consider clemency for every single woman incarcerated for potentially killing her abuser, but he would consider the letter a request from the women who had signed it. So it was not quite the, the answer that they had hoped for. And in the end, he granted clemency to three, denied it to seven, and just made no decision whatsoever on the remaining. But the other result of the Crazy Women Against Abuse Group's clemency campaign is that they drew the attention of outside advocates and lawyers who decided that they were going to jump in and start helping. So they helped the women draft their arguments and gather evidence for their clemency petitions. Again, you know, what can you find? What documentation is there? Who might have witnessed this? Who might be able to like, submit an affidavit and say, you know, on such and such a day, you know, I saw right there and her husband and he gave her a letter. You know, on such and such a day, you know, like, that I had to drive this person to the hospital. Um, and then after that, they formed a group called Free Battered Women to continue organizing, raising public awareness, and advocating for the release of women who are in prison for self-defense. And during their time, which I think was like the next 15 years, it resulted in the release of more than 30 other domestic violence survivors. So they chipped away, chipped away, chipped away, chipped away at this. And they didn't give up just because one governor was not as understanding. But because we don't see battering and abuse as a prison issue, this kind of resistance and organizing is often left out of what we think about when we think about organizing and resisting and challenging prison conditions. So fast forward to today, there are calls for clemency to Governor Brown, who I think is leaving this. Yes. Um, so it really kind of has nothing to lose at this point, you know, by granting clemency to people. Um, to grant clemency to more domestic violence survivors in prison. Um, women who have either are serving lengthy or life sentences for defending themselves against abuse or being coerced into crimes by their abusive partners. Um, so I can talk more about that later, but if you are interested, there's a website called Survive and Punish, which actually lists many of the women who are applying for clemency. Um, who would otherwise serve life sentences in prison. And I want to, I want to give a cautionary note because we're talking about reforms. Criminal justice reform was on the horizon under Obama. Like it's kind of sunk a little bit, um, you know, now, now that Trump is in office. But we're, when we're talking about it on the state level, let's talk about ways in which we can actually have actual 
justice reforms that don't actually expand the prison system. And again, kind of going back into history, uh, women's prisons themselves, keep in mind, came out of calls for reform. So before the 1870s, women were held in attics, basements, adjoining cells of men's prisons. These were awful and horrendous. I not, you know, they, they, they often were like left in their like little cells or you know, attics or basements, they weren't given access to programs, um, they were often subjected to sexual abuse by sexual abuse and sexual assault by the guards, they were and by the men inside as well. And so in 1874, Quaker reformers led a campaign to end the sexual abuse of the women who were imprisoned in a male prison in, <clears throat> in Indiana. And they called for a separate women's prison, arguing that if the women were in a women's prison without men, with women guarding them, there would not be women's sexual assault and sexual abuse. And other states followed suit. And by 1940, 23 states established separate women's prisons. So that was the start of women's prisons. But having women-only prisons increased the number of women who were sentenced to prison. So whereas before, a woman would go before a judge, and a judge would say, well, what you did was horrific and horrible, or maybe it wasn't so horrific and horrible, but going, being sent to a men's prison as a woman <coughs> is going to be torturous and deathly, like, I mean, et cetera, et cetera. So, Maybe I would want to send you to prison. But suddenly there was this place that the judges could send people. And they started to, in Illinois, before they started their, before they opened their women's prison, there had been no more than 10 women ever in prison at any given time. The first female only prison was a 100 cell building. So think about this. Like you've only incarcerated 10 people at any given time. You can build a cottage. You don't need to build a 100 cell building. Yet, Illinois built a 100 cell building and then proceeded to start to fill it. And during the next decade, the total number of women sentenced to prison and it continues to grow and grow and grow. In New York, the same thing happened. There were repeated calls for separate women's prisons, which, was, which resulted in the state's first reformatory in 1887. And within two years, that prison had reached its capacity of 234. So imagine you build it and you can build it. Um, and then, because it had reached its capacity, reformers said, well, you can't have women in this prison. Let's build more. So two others, Albion and Bedford Hills, were opened. And both of them remain open today as women's prisons. And there are all sorts of atrocities and um, awful conditions that happen in, I think, Albion. In the 1990s, was the subject of a lawsuit around women's sexual abuse and sexual assault. Both have been cited for all the medical care, etc., etc., etc. So these calls for reform actually resulted in the ability to incarcerate more people. And I say this because we're, as we're thinking about reform, we need to be thinking about what are ways in which we address people's needs. All of those things that I talked about earlier: racial racism, racial profiling, uh, economic injustice, domestic violence, <coughs> and what are ways. <coughs> that they can be addressed that are not aging people. Um, so, let's talk about some of the ways in which people on the outside can support these kinds of changes, both to address the conditions inside, but without making change, the prison system bigger or stronger. So, going back into California history, in 1976, California used to only have one women's prison. Um, you had three for a while, and now you only have oh, And you still have three because you only have a women's prison. Um, I was like, oh, wait, I forgot about that. So, and now you have three. And a new one for folks. A new one that I've got approved by the county supervisor. A prison, prison. Oh, um, right. Sen sentenced people. They're moving from like one woman's jail to a bigger facility. Okay. All right. Uh, this is LA supervisor's just approved. Okay. So going back, so in 1976, the One Women's Prison um, established what they called an alternative program unit, or a solitary confinement unit for women who were seen as disruptive. So women who were seen as leaders, you know, or organizers, women who were lesbians, women who were perceived as lesbians, or women who were just disobedient, women who just like, and if you think about what that means, you know, what that, what that goes back to when you're like, women who are disobedient. You know, um, and so they were placed in the 
solitary confinement unit. And women inside the prison organized against this unit, and people on the outside also organized against this unit. They organized a rally outside the prison where people who had been in that unit spoke out. They organized media coverage, which generated public outrage, particularly around the ways in which women were put in these solitary confinement units. They pressed their public, their state officials um, to condemn the unit. And this led the prison to close down this prison within a prison um, shortly after that. And then while the women were not released from prison, they were at least not subject to all of this solitary confinement. So that is a way in which you can fight back or push back against repressive prison conditions without necessarily saying, like, let's build a nicer, prettier, more, more expansive jail or prison with more beds. <coughs> I asked women in prison across the nation what are some of the ways in which they thought that people on the outside could support them in their struggles. And they came up with a laundry list. The first thing that they said repeatedly was that, they, that people should have more contact with them themselves. That is how you find out what is going on. That is how you find out what their priorities are. And that is how you find out what people need. Um, speaking out about the issues that confront them and connecting them with other types of work. So prisons don't happen in the silo. You know, if you think about whatever issues that you are working on and that you are passionate about, there's always an intersection of incarceration. If you organize around education, think about the fact that so many people who end up in prison did not have access to education beforehand. Think about the fact that in 1994, Congress cut Pell Grants, which funded college in prison programs, even though Pell Grants to people in prison up like one tenth of one percent of the Pell Grant budget. So it wasn't that I wasn't going to college or you weren't going to college or you weren't going to college because of these Pell Grants going to people in prison. It was just purely a punitive measure. Um, and there were studies that showed that people who got higher degrees were less likely to end up back in prison because they had a little bit more opportunity when they came home to uh, get jobs and financially sustain themselves. Um, Joining organizations that work around incarcerated women's issues. So here in California, um, there's a group called California Coalition for Women Prisoners. There's a network called Surviving the Foundation. Um, there's Foundations for Humanities. Like, look at what's around there and see how you plug in and figure out what your what your abilities are. You know, like so you can say like, okay, you know, I, I can't necessarily go and do this much work, but I can do this much. You know, I am a this, and this is how I. Um, like how can I put my energies and my talents and my passions to use in these kinds of intersections. Hoping to establish programs that aren't used to disguise problems that are inherent in the prison system. Um, I'm thinking of Foundations in the Humanities. Um, you can talk to Susan, you can talk to Adam about this later, about ways you can join in later. And supporting and participating in programs that can challenge these dominant ways of thinking and power structures. Um, in the 1970s, there was a group called the Santa Cruz Women's Prison Project, which went into the one women's prison that you had at the time. And outside volunteers <coughs> went in to do workshops and classes with the women there. And what they did was they didn't just go in and say, like, let's talk about Jesus and pray, you know, like, and eat pizza. They offered courses that actually addressed the issues that were relevant to incarcerated women's lives. So they offered a course called Women in the Law. They offered something about drug use in US culture. They offered a course that focused on the historical and sociological perspectives of women of color in the US, which in the 1970s was kind of this unheard of thing, most places, let alone inside the prison, which housed mostly uh, women of color. And then they also brought in news from the outside world. And they brought in different aspects and different perspectives on what was going on in the outside world. So they brought in. Um, information about the Vietnam War, and then they actually had women in the prison write letters of solidarity to women political prisoners in Vietnam. Now, if you think about the things that are happening in the world today, and then you think about some of the reactionary propaganda that happens in the media, in the news, and think about what it would mean if you are in a prison and the only thing you get is, I have no idea what people are talking about in prisons get, you know, the, like some reactionary Let's bomb everybody to hell. Everybody is a terrorist. 
whereas everybody is a criminal. And then to have somebody else come in with a different perspective and to say, like, here's some other reading material. Here are things that you are not seeing. Here are things that you can connect with. And imagine what that would look like, you know, if you had people actually thinking about these kinds of issues. Um, when the separations were happening, the family separations were happening at the border, you know, I wrote to various women in prison and I said, you know, like our people, or I wrote to various people in prison and I said, what are people thinking about there? And the women who had heard about it were totally horrified and they connected it with their own struggles around their own families and they said, this is awful, you know, like, you know, like this reflects what happened, you know, like when I was arrested and my children were taken away, so many other women are, you know, equally destroyed. It's actually interesting. The men were like, "Yeah, it doesn't affect us. We don't care." I said, "Wow, like that's that's interesting." Mm, like, yeah. Um, but you know, bringing that in and also connecting them back to larger struggles as well. So imagine doing these kinds of like connecting the dots, you know, inside and outside, so that it's not just prisons are there. And sometimes we think about that. Oftentimes we don't, because that is the purpose of prison is to invisibilize people and to make them, to render them obsolete, and imagine bringing people back into these struggles. And I want to end with a quote um, from a woman who participated in my book, it's the last quote in my book, um, but I think it holds really true to what I've just been talking about. And she said, when I said, you know, what are some of the ways in which people on the outside need to work put in inside? And she said, I was thinking about how we are very cut off from much of the rest of the world including people who do not support the prison system or people who may be interested in our struggle. I think that more communication by the letters would help. I think that would encourage resistance on both ends because it would strengthen information and knowledge both ways. I also think that hearing about efforts of resistance outside of prison would inspire and encourage us prisoners. Plus, through correspondence, people can see that many incidents that they read or hear about happen daily, and it will really legitimize them. The communication between two humans concerning their hopes, ideas, and their plights is what allows them to bond in resistance against a system that affects everyone in many different ways. We would be inspired to see another position of struggle, and that though they may differ, all of our struggles are shared. This would strengthen our resistance, both inside and outside.
people who go into prison often have different priorities than people who go into prison. So like if they are parents, their first concern is their children. If they are not, you know, and men are concerned about their children, but not in the same way because they're not worried about foster care. They're not worried about abusive coherence or abusive family members their children. They're not worried about having their parental rights terminated. Um, so, um, so I was seeing that they, if you have different priorities, you have different ways of organizing. I just accumulated all this information. I wrote my paper. I threw everything in a drawer, and I just kept getting information. And I kept thinking, somebody's going to write a book about this. That'll be great. <laughs> you know, it's like you know, I went about live my life, whatever. You know, and then nobody wrote this book, and I just had got more and more information. And it's like eventually, like this drawer is just overflowing with stuff. You know, like letters sending me clippings of articles and other stuff I found. So it's like, I guess maybe I'll try to write this, you know, book. And so what I did was I wrote to every single woman in prison who was still in prison or who I still had contact with. A couple of women got out and I wasn't able to get contact with them. Um, and I said, and I had met somebody who was interested in publishing. I met my publisher at a party at the snack table because that is always where I have to be found. And, you know, he, he was really enthusiastic about this idea. And I said, okay, great. So I wrote everybody a letter and I said, dear so-and-so, you know, I have some really exciting news. We've been corresponding over the years. You've been telling me what's happening inside the prison, the year of the prison that you've been in. Um, I have to offer a book deal. You know, like there's no money attached. I can't offer you any money. I would like to use your experiences, but I understand that you wrote to me not thinking that this was going to be a book. Originally you wrote to me because you thought I was some dumb college student writing a paper. You know, that's fine. But so, a, can I use your experiences? B, if I do, how would you like to be identified or not identified, uh, given you know the very real threat of retaliation? C, I can send you drafts of everything that I write that includes your story. So everybody got, everybody who say contributed to the education chapter got multiple copies of that draft as I went through. And every woman said yes, include my experiences in the book. A couple of women said, please don't use my name. One woman said, you can use my name in everything except the experiences in which I was sexually abused. I did not want that. You know, so, and I let them have that agency. Um, and I sent multiple drafts of every chapter. And I think one of the nice things about women's prisons, maybe we can cut this out of anything that gets archived, is that the prison guards didn't really read the mail because women in prison aren't known to be organizers and resistors. So, you know, I'm sure they just saw something that looked like this with lots and lots of scroll on the back of it, and they were like, there's no drugs or contraband, and I don't really care to read, you know, 20 pages. It's, you know, because not a single person said, you know, like, hey, I got in trouble for this letter, or, you know, it's like, hey, it's what you said. And what also happened is that they started responding to things. So in my, the chapter on education, I quoted a study done at Bedford Hills, which is the women's prison in New York, that had, at the time, a really progressive superintendent. So she allowed college programs to come in. She allowed HIV educators to come in. You know, she allowed all of these things to happen. And so the study was a little, it didn't resonate with women who were incarcerated in other state prisons who are like, hey, this study actually makes it seem like women are so torn by like their responsibilities and the chaos of their lives on the outside and prison is this quiet place where they can study. And some of the women wrote back and they were like, actually, you know, we find that prisons are really awful places to learn. We're glad to be able to learn, but you know, we go on lockdown and then we can't go to classes. Um, the teachers order the books and the books don't come. The teachers order the notebook paper, and the notebook paper doesn't come. We've gone through half a semester without having required tests, where people don't have paper. You know, but the teachers not allowed to bring in just like you know paper from Staples to be like, I brought you paper. Like it has to come through the central processing ordering unit to make sure that I don't know there aren't drugs in the paper or something. So therefore, we're trying to do this class, and we don't even have these materials, and we still persevere. You know, we still persevere, but it is not this idyllic place. And so women actually started reacting to what they were seeing, because I would send a whole draft of a chapter, not just a paragraph. And they started reacting, and they started adding their observations and comments as well. And they were like, you know, that thing that person said over here really resonates with me here, because that also happens in our prison. Or that thing over there, yeah, not so much here, you know. Um, 
please don't make it seem like this is this wonderful thing that we're doing these days because it's not. So that was also really interesting. And then when my book came out, my publisher agreed to send a copy to every single woman who participated. And the only prison that did not let it in was in Idaho because they said that it considered, they considered it prisoner to prisoner correspondence. And that was the only thing that, like, the only place that didn't get in. In Colorado, in like some small little town in Pueblo, um, apparently the woman showed her book around to people, in the, to the other women in the prison, and the women called home and they'd be like, Mom, Mom, when you like come to visit, can you bring this book? So the local Barnes and Noble got a bunch of calls asking about this book, and they were like, this must be the next bestseller. And they actually ordered it for and they like, you know, put like a little display. So this prison town in Fairville, Colorado had a display of resistance behind bars. So you know, like it was like a weird, very reaction to it, where people were really excited because they were like, we can never see ourselves reflected. It sort of reflects though your work, that it it starts to, you know, the, the women who you were started to drive the project mm -hmm. and were co-created with you. Yeah, even in terms of the demand for the books. Mm -hmm. I mean, now with the different restrictions on ma on mail, like in Pennsylvania, um, as Professor German pointed out earlier, Pennsylvania is eliminating ways in which people can get mail. So now you can't just order a book. Your family member can't order a book on Amazon and have it sent to you. They have to go to the Department of Correction and say, "I would like to order a Resistance Behind Bars by Victoria Law." And the Department of Correction might say, "Like, yeah, we don't have a venture that carries that. Sorry." So, so like we could like maybe see ways in which you know that kind of information and knowledge might get stimulated. Yeah, thank you very much for the talk. Um, last week I heard two in our broadcasts that are not female presence, I mean women's presence, and um, one very important. Uh, thing uh, the report has focused on was the really strong increase, I mean for in women's prisons, minor infractions mm -hmm. are uh, followed by a much higher rate of disciplinary tickets than men's prisons. And uh, even, I mean, you mentioned the, dis uh, the, the disciplinary tickets that can lead to, to special phone calls, this and so on. So, um, this reporting focused on some effort apparently to create prisons for women that um, are more um, women conforming, I suppose. I mean, I'm sure the, the word is not the best, but uh, because uh, the, the thinking is that women's prisons should not be built like men's prisons. And um, uh, so I was wondering whether what you think about that in the perspective of the goal to abolish prisons of I think that if you're talking about um, like just building other prisons, then you, you kind of lost sight of the fact that, you know, like the the fact that like we're sending people to prisons is a huge failure. You know, sending people to prisons, especially at this astronomical rate. And so building new Facilities doesn't necessarily change the culture of the ways that prisons are run. So in New York City right now, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with New York City, we have a giant island called Rikers Island. If you ever fly into LaGuardia Airport and like look out the like right hand window as you're flying in, you'll see it. Um, and it's it has roughly 9,000 something people on any given day. It used to be 15,000, so the numbers are slightly dropping. Um, and it's mostly people who are detained in pretrial. And there's been a movement to close Rikers because it is an abominable cesspool. It is actually probably, I think, built on landfill and sludge and disgusting toxic things. And build smaller jails in different boroughs. New York City has five boroughs. Uh, they want to build borough jails in four of the boroughs. But what they're talking about is building, like an architectural building, but it doesn't change the fact that it's still the same officer's union members, you know, like the same members of the officers' union who are running these jails. It doesn't change the fact that people are still being sent to jail on ridiculous bails. Like, um, how many of you have heard the story of Keith Browder, the 16-year-old that spent three years in jail for allegedly stealing a backpack? 
And then the DA finally dropped the charges against him. And while he was in jail, he was subject to all sorts of assault by the other young men around him. He was sent to solitary confinement. He was assaulted by officers. And he finally, and he kept saying, I'm not going to plead out. I did not steal his backpack. I did not steal his backpack. He finally got out and a year later committed suicide. You know, like the, those that stayed with him for so long. But building a new jail doesn't address any of these issues that like are left to this It's just a new building. So I think instead of, so I think a, there should be a pushback to say like, we, we shouldn't be building these things. You know, if you're going to keep people in jails and prisons, what are you doing to change this culture? And what are you doing to get more people out? And also, who cares if a woman in the hallway, like men in prison don't get written up for cursing in the hallway. Ask, you know, most of the men in prison, be like, do you ever get written up by cursing in the hall, for cursing in the hallway? And they will probably laugh. So, so I think part of it is like shifting that narrative to say like, you know, let's not rush to build more things, right? Like the Quaker reformers were like, we need to go to women's jails and prisons because women are being sexually assaulted. And then they just led to judges saying, great, I'm not sending you to a rape factory anymore. I guess I'll send you to this prison. So that, that brings me into another question. So I was going to ask you, you were talking about, so in, on that topic um, of expanding more jails, and building more jails, we were talking about Pell Grants, re implementation of Pell Grants, and whatnot. I was wondering what you think about that, or how do you negotiate participating in some of these educational programs or literacy programs in jail, where we know that they're kind of being used to expand the carceral state. And uh, what I was thinking of as an example is you talk about the Santa Cruz, the Santa Cruz Women's Jail. And so there was a recent thing in Santa Cruz where but there was a there was a budget for California for different counties to apply for a certain amount of a certain amount of money to kind of decrease the prison population. And so what a lot of them did was build more county jails to transfer the, the prison time, you know. So if you did if you get a sense that like less than five years of prison time you your sense in county jail. So they started building these jails that were like program jails basically, right? And they were saying like they're not gonna be having locked doors, they're gonna be education, and they created jobs for you know PhDs who couldn't find academic appointments and like they solved all these problems, right? But it's just like so it just really expanded the carceral state under the guise of educational programs. And so I'm just wondering like, if the goal is to, um, you know, education is an outlet for people who are incarcerated, and the goal is to decarcerate. How do we negotiate participating in these programs when we know the, um, the implications, um, the way that they're being kind of co-opted? I think it's a, it's a way of looking at, you know, like what is the program and what is the goal, right? So like, you know, instead of saying, like, let's build educational channels, right? Like, but say like, you know, looking at, at it as, you know, like what am I doing in terms of, you know, like helping people access education. So again, kind of like looking at like the Santa Cruz Women's Prison Project or Foundations and Humanities, which is not like, let's build a special jail so that people can come to our program and get education, but to say like, let's, you know, like work with people because decarceration doesn't happen on this like, map, you know, like on this really quick scale. We would like it to, but it's not. So there's going to be thousands, hundreds of thousands of people still kind of like languishing behind bars. Kind of like you can't say, let's not address, say, pregnancy, you know, care or lack of pregnancy care, you know, because we're trying to abolish prison. So just kind of pull that baby in until, you know, until we, until we abolish prisons. So in the same way, looking at it as, you know, like how do we do this in a way that is meaningful? Um, earlier I talked to Professor Derwin about how in Oklahoma women's prisons, all of the native programs Oklahoma, there's a disproportionate number of Native women sentenced to prison in Oklahoma. And all of the Native programming is born again Baptist based programming. Like celebrate recovery with Jesus, you know, like do this, with, you know, like, and women go to that because it is a program. Because it is a way to get out of their cell. Because it is a way for them to like get pizza and pan or whatever. And it's not, I don't want to say it's not programming that's meaningful because they might argue differently, but if that's the only available programming that they have, that's what they're going to latch on to. So looking at edu like participating in educational programming as, is this a way to just kind of like mask the problems in the prison? You know, if we all embrace Jesus, then you know, like, it doesn't matter that we're in a prison. We're going to say like, these are the things that we actually want to get out of this. These are the things that like people actually need to be, you know, like, to either survive while they're in prison, you, you know, like learn something and like participate in their own, you know, growth, you know, like um, intellectual stimulation, or is this something that the person is just, you know, uh, like use it as a smoke screen to be like, get out of yourself, you get some pizza, you buy. 
So I think it's like examining what it is that you're willing to participate in and saying like how do we do this. And also saying we don't need specific jails for people to be educated in. Like why are we pouring money into building the more, you know, more partial facilities? Is it great? You know, if you're gonna put money into education, put the money into education. Don't put the money into like the bricks and the mortar and the you know whatever else goes to like building a new facility and then be like, oh yeah, so that money for education. Yeah, we put it into sheet rocking, you know, like for instance, that. Last question, and then we'll continue over. There's two, so you want to just ask one question, and then I'll just ask them, and then we'll continue over wine and cheese, the conversation. Um, so lately I've noticed how our culture has really started to intersect with social activism. For example, you notice that what started to uh, pop culture and, oh. and social activism are really intersecting, especially with protests uh, regarding productive rights and the Handmaid's Tale costumes. And I'm wondering if, in this case, I think what comes to mind is Orange is the New Black. Do you see the overall impact of shows like that being positive or negative? Or just what are your thoughts on how that plays a role in conscious or like raising awareness? Okay. Ask your question. Um, presentation and centering abolition in the conversation. I think that's very refreshing. Um, and I guess my question was, um, you kind of talked a little bit about it in terms of um, when we were talking about um, others affected and, and impacted by incarceration, right? So you're talking, you're talking about the foster system, for example. Um, and while in LA, in LA there's some work being done to um, contextualize prison abolition as a public health um, focus, centering on as we're abolishing prisons, what are we building instead? Right, um, but there's there's still a long way um, to go to there. So I guess part of what my question is: Have you found um, folks or narratives or groups who are kind of working on the collective health? Like, what is the impact on our collective health of so many be people being incarcerated? Even if I don't have a family member incarcerated, first of all, there's those folks that don't get looked at, right? Family mm -hmm. members of folks incarcerated, um, but then you have communities, for example, in LA, where. Um, half the population is literally not there because they're in jails or um, in foster systems. So is there, um, is there any work being done around that collective health and kind of framing it um, that, that you can highlight um, as a current abolition tool? Yeah, and sorry, I just want to add in real quick too. How come we're the only country that um, punish our youth to such extremes? I don't see any other country that can put their you know, children behind bars for, you know, they're not old enough to drink, but they're old enough to go to prison um, for, you know, drugs or whatever it may, I, you know, especially, as I said, this war on drugs is, is crap, in my opinion, but um, where they have, I, I mean, how come it's our country that does, that we put our youth behind bars for so long, we'll give somebody, you know, 20 years for uh, possession or for some, and I don't understand that, like you said, I don't understand why it's not being put in education and how, I'm sorry I missed the first part that I was getting my son, but, um, just what, like what avenues can we take in our kind of, I just, I don't understand how come we're so, we're so harsh, we're so extreme, we're paying money, but punishing instead of bettering our, you know, our future. Okay. So one, two, three, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> and then I can like expand over, over the reception. So um, yours, um, there was a recent report put out by a group called the SD Justice Group. They're based in California. It is a group that is mostly female family members of people who are incarcerated, some of them are also formerly incarcerated, and they just did a report specifically about, if not collective public health, of like what happens if you like live in a neighborhood but you're not directly, directly impacted by incarceration, but what are the public health costs and what are the financial and emotional costs of having an incarcerated loved one, and so that's a good place to start. And I just read that report on a by and something else. So I'm like, oh, that comes to mind immediately. And from there, like, you know, like there are issues they can point you towards other places that might start to be exploring this. Um, why do we punish youth so harshly? Because we're, we started to like build up, starting from the 1960s, 1970s, this idea that we need to be really tough on crime. And that just keeps expanding. And that like to pawn youth in the net as well. You know, like, so what used to be. And this like idea of tough on crime. You know, like, you know, like, you must, you know, like, you, if you do the crime, you must serve the time. You know, start with adults, and it keeps expanding. So, you know, like, so, you know, it, it, it encompasses black children, but it also encompasses white children, you know, like, as, as a sort of, like, drag along thing. So, policies that are meant to, like, support and punish certain populations just keep getting dragged on. 
So yes. So um, in New York and California, 16 and 17, 16 year olds are automatically tried as adults unless their lawyer can argue with a judge successfully to get them tried as youthful offenders. The, these are the only two states in which you are automatic for you know like tried unless your public defender has you know has enough willpower to like get up there and like argue this. You know, so a 16 year old could actually be sentenced to like life in prison for something like that as well. Um, and your question about orange is the new black is actually like a conversation we just had with our lunch. Is that um, I have very like so I am appreciative that Orange is the New Black is not like Oz or one of these shows and where like people in prison are just like terrible, crazy, psychotic people that like nobody wants to be around. Um, but I think it does present this weird, distorted image of women in prison. At the same time as somebody who's like writing about, researching, working with, and reporting on women in prison, it's opened the door to have these conversations. As I was saying over lunch, like I would be at some like parent function, you know, like so there's a bunch of people there. You know, and they'd be like, so you know, from like all walks of life, and they'd be like, what do you do? And I'd be like, oh, I write about women in prison, and they'd be like, oh yeah, that's nice. And I'd be like, yeah, I just finished this piece about like you know, like solitary confinement, you know. And they'd be like, oh. And I'd be like, yeah, did you know that? And they'd be like, yeah, that's, that's really nice. <laughs> and you know, and now with Orange is the New Black, they're like, what do you do? And I say, I write about women in prison. And they're like, oh, like Orange is the New Black. What do you think about you know, blah, blah, blah. and it opens that door to be able to talk about these issues in a way I think that wasn't open earlier, judging from like, all these people that really did not talk to me <laughs> at, at different events. Um, so and I think there's a lot of work to be done, but it, it, it gives an opening for people to like 